On today's episode, we break down the Thomas Hurdle trade, who San Jose is getting, and David Ekstrom, and our thoughts on Ekstrom's projection, his game, and his fit, all coming on today's episode of Locked On NHL Prospects. You are Locked On NHL Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to Locked On NHL Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. On this podcast, we recount everything prospects related for you five days a week, Monday to Friday. I'm Hattie Kalakesh, joined by Sebastian High, and on today's show, we'll be breaking down the Thomas Hurdle trade. In our first segment, we'll talk about our thoughts on the trade, we'll we'll break it down in detail, what each team is getting, and what we think of the return for Thomas Hurdle. Uh, We'll also talk about uh, David Edstrom's game more in detail in the second segment, we'll break down what his strengths are, what his weaknesses are. Um, and overall what kind of makes him tick and what made him a first-round pick in the 2023 NHL draft. And then in our final segment, we'll talk about our projection for Edstrom, where he slots in the San Jose prospect pool, um, and what kind of player San Jose Sharks fans can expect out of this guy. So we'll get into it all on today's episode. But before we get into it, today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. We're so close to a thousand subscribers; it would be great if you can help us get get there. Uh, if you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform, though, make sure to make us your first listen of the day and leave a rating review on the channel. Uh, so let's get started right away with the return for Thomas Hurdle. We'll talk about the trade in detail. Um, break it down for me what each team is getting in this trade here. For sure. It was a last minute shocker uh, broken by Bob McKenzie on the TSN panel, which I was watching. And it was quite the mic drop when it got announced uh, that that Thomas Hurdle was was, uh, being traded to the Vegas Golden Knights within the same division in the Pacific. So the San Jose Sharks send uh, Thomas Hurdle as well as third round draft picks in both 2025 and 2027 to Vegas in exchange for uh, recently drafted uh, first round prospect David Edstrom and uh, Las Vegas's 2025 first round draft pick, which is unprotected, uh, which is a very big trade. And there was initially a bit of confusion as to in which direction those two third round picks were going. And I remember my initial reaction when uh, they were seemingly going from uh, fr- from Vegas to San Jose, uh, that even then it was a, a slightly underwhelming return for Thomas Hurdle with that 17% of his contract being retained for this season as well as the next six years after this one and we can delve into what that means for San Jose's salary uh, cap structure and and their flexibility in in, in making trades but uh yeah it, it it's a trade and a half what's your reaction here Oh my goodness. Um, you mentioned the two third rounders. I was certain when the trade was announced that those thirds were going to San Jose, not the other way around. Yeah. Um, it is a weird one. I mean, you know, we were talking about this just before starting recording, but San Jose is basically giving away as many prospects as they're getting back technically in this trade. So it's like a two for two and you just include a uh, hurdle in there for the upgrades and the prospect quality, but it's just like, and the retention, I mean, yeah, and the reten- like I think the retention is the biggest part of this. You're retaining 17% yeah. over six years, but you know, it, it is a small amount compared to the the issue which is that you're you're losing a trade uh, uh, or um sorry, you're losing a salary retention slot for the next 6 years. That's a big part of this. Salary retention slots have increased in value over the last years. We see a lot more teams brokering trades and using their salary retention slot to help out another team um, and help them retain salary on a, on a specific trade. And it usually nets you a, a fourth or fifth round pick. I mean, that's still value you're losing there. So the equivalent of that going the other way, as well as the two thirds and as well as hurdle and only getting Estrom in a first in return. Uh, really seems underwhelming, but that really speaks to how much Mike Greer is sold on Estrem's upside. Because the the first is unprotected, and that's cool. But we're talking about the Vegas Golden Knights; like they're fine, they're gonna be okay. Um, and yeah, Vegas just continues to add dra- trade deadline after trade deadline to go and get the biggest fish in in, in the pool and uh, bring it to their team. So yeah, I mean, th- this trade is confusing to me, but you know. Which part of this do you see as the bigger issue? Is it kind of the, the losing that retention slot and retaining 17% and still getting so little in return? 
or is it the return itself? Like, what, what's what's the bigger issue with this trade for you? It, it's more about uh, the retention slot as well as the inclusion of two third round draft picks. Like, those are going to be high third round draft picks. At least the first one of those two, the twenty twenty five one, is going to be in the upper ends of that third round. And yeah, just to name a few players that that were available in the early third round in last year's draft class: Jacob Fowler, Jaden Perron, who isn't having the greatest season this year, but is a high upside play that could still hit. You have a lot of players that may have fallen out of favor for various reasons, but have some first round hype that end up falling to the early third round every single year. It happens all the time. And to lose those two draft picks along with Thomas Hurdle, as well as that retention slot. And all you're getting back is David Enstrom, who we're, we're going to really delve into his game in finer detail in the next segment, but at best, a really solid middle six center, like a like three C is like my my optimistic expectation uh, with David Edstrom long term. He's not going to be one of San Jose's best five forward prospects in their in their prospect pool, and that first round draft pick is going to be a very late one. There's there's very little value coming back here. On the one hand, maybe there was some concern about that Thomas Hurdle contract moving forward, and they wanted to uh, like get it off the books earlier. I mean, we've seen San Jose hang on to massive contracts longer than they than they can, and then being stuck with them. Like think of Mark Edward Vlasic or Logan Couture, or uh, I mean, even Eric Carlson before his massive breakout seemed to have like a really negative value contract. Yeah, that has a uh, has an aspect to, uh, to at play here, but. When I'm looking at it from the other angle, Vegas was able to add a really underrated two-way center with a ton of skill, a lot of size, high level of intelligence at like under $7 million a year. And they're adding two third round draft picks on top of that. And they're losing a solid prospect that they just drafted in David Edstrom, but far from anything untradeable, especially for the Vegas Golden Knights, he was yeah. not going to be prospect that was going to stop their their trend of of trading all all of their first round picks uh and then as well as a late as a, as a late first rounder in all likelihood like if, if san jose has any luck maybe vegas misses the playoffs next year but you're banking on a big if with that and i think vegas added a really really great player here who sure might have some negative value on his contract over the last two or so years of the deal but by that point vegas will not care anymore because their contention window will have closed yeah, for sure. I, I think the other part of that is I really like what Vegas is doing, which is they're they're when they pick a prospect, they're picking them with the with the mindset in mind of how do I maximize value here rather than trying to maximize upside. You know, David Edstrom wasn't the highest upside player in the and available at thirty second overall by any means. But I think that what they've done by picking him, and especially with the progression in his game over the past year, playing in the SHL full time, um you know, going to the world juniors, being such an effective shutdown center for Sweden. Um, I think all that was kind of part of the plan for them because at this specific stage in his development, you know, in terms of the prospect picked, the prospects picked in this range uh, in the 2023 NHL draft, I can't name you many that have, that have more trade value than a guy like David Edstrom, especially I was thinking more for contenders. Like, you know, you're, if you're a contender and you're looking yeah. to add a solid prospect, who's definitely going to be playing in your bottom half of the lineup and um, will almost definitely be an NHLer. David Edstrom is about as clear a bet for that as, as possible. Um, but regardless, I think Vegas has done a good job of picking the highest value prospect available rather than picking the highest upside player available, you know, cause probably would have preferred another prospect at 32, but you know, if you trade them right now, if you send them right now in that trade, you're going to have to give up more than you did. If you gave up David Estram, especially with how much Mike Greer, you know, Mike Greer lauded David Estram's game when the trade was announced and he, you know, spoke up about it. He was saying how important David Estrem was to that Sweden team, how he was play, taking defensive zone faceoffs for them all the time, playing shutdown minutes for them. All that goes into play when you're talking about trading a prospect and what their value is. So, yeah, Vegas did an excellent job uh, with this 32nd overall pick because, again, I can't name you many prospects picked in that range that have more value. And we're talking about trade value than, than David Estrem did. Um, and, yeah, now he's a San Jose Shark. So we'll get into, you know, what the, the San Jose Sharks are getting out of David Edstrom, what kind of style that he plays, what his strengths are, what his weaknesses are. We'll get into that after these messages from our sponsors over at Game Time. 
If you're looking to buy cheap tickets last minute to any event, GameTime is the best place to get that done. GameTime is a great app that you can use to get tickets up to the last minute before an event starts and sometimes an hour after it starts. And it's not just for sports. You know, you can go to your favorite game and get a ticket last minute with GameTime, but you can also get tickets to sport, to, to, to comedy, theater, basically anything that requires tickets. Uh, Game time has you covered. They have a bunch of deals and they're obsessed with saving you money. Um, my favorite deal is zone deals, uh, where you pick the section and game time picks a seat, and that gives you an average of about 18% of savings. Uh, and the game time guarantee makes sure that you always get the best price for your tickets. If you find a ticket for uh in the same section and row for less than what game time has to offer, game time credits you 110% of the difference. So take your guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. You download the Game Time app, create an account, create an account, and use a code locked on any shell for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply, but again, super easy. You just create an account and redeem the code locked on any shell for $20 off your first purchase. So download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price. Guarantee. Alrighty, so moving on to our second segment, we'll be talking about what San Jose is getting in this trade out of David Edstrom. He was the, he was the 32nd overall pick in the 2023 NHL draft, the last pick of the first round. Um, talk me through what you like about David Edstrom's game, because there is a lot to like here, right? There certainly is. Like we're going to start with the profile here first. Uh, so he is a six foot three, hundred and ninety pound left shot center, and he's going to bring an element to San Jose's prospect pool that they have been lacking. And we've been talking about this a little bit in recent weeks. Like we mentioned it in the Liam Greentree profile episode that the Sharks have a lot of like undersized skill or a bunch of soft skill overall in their forward core, but that they lack uh, like like an added element of size and physical physicality and grit while also combining that with intelligence to be able to peak to keep up with the pace of play uh playing with higher skilled players and Edstrom brings that element certainly so last season uh as a draft eligible he was he put up 20 28 points in 28 games in j20 uh as well as uh four points in 11 shl games and this season he's been playing full time uh with Ferlunda in the shl and has put up seven goals and 19 points in 43 games including a, a goal and an assist uh in the in the game the day after the trade was finalized so a uh, good first impression uh, as a san jose shark there for david edstrom but from, from a stylistic standpoint this is a a composed two-way centerman who lacks dynamic skill, uh, is a little bit lacking in terms of pace, but is really intelligent, uh, makes deft one-touch plays, uh, quite decisive uh, with the decisions he does make with the puck on his stick, likes to make the simple play to retain possession. He's very much possession-oriented. He's flashed some decent small area playmaking game, but the offensive tool that really stands out here is his goal scoring. He has a pretty pretty decent release uh especially his snapshot from like like the mid slot has been quite a, a weapon in my in my viewings going going uh over the last like year and a half and it's progressed as well throughout that time span the skating is a little bit eh, like he's not the, the quickest guy uh he he's, he he moves around the ice relatively fluidly but he's going to be a very average nhl skater in in my view uh but the upside with him in the offensive zone comes with the flashes of power game. He's six foot three. He's very strong. And uh, there has been flashes of him really lowering the shoulder, driving the net with speed and using his, his release to really elevate the puck from in tight and, and, and being able to create dangerous opportunities from there. But these have been flashes more than anything in terms of the offensive impact. What has been really consistent with David Edstrom has been focusing on possession hockey, getting the puck onto the sticks of his teammates that are really good at retaining that possession and creating with it. Like look at the world junior championships uh, in, in December and January, he was playing that role on a third line, being a defensive shutdown centerman, really reliable in terms of winning defensive zone draws um and and plays a physical defensive style like he applies a lot of pressure defensively and is quite intelligent with how he does so but the upside in my view is is very much limited to middle six i would say there's an an outside chance he can be a a stabilizing force on a second line but the likelihood of that, I think, is quite small. I think what you're likely getting with him is a shutdown 3C long-term, 
play your comp, I might say a guy like Lars Eller would be the upside here in terms of that defensive solidity, the intelligence, and the flashes of offense at times, especially in in times when, when you need a goal to be scored. Edstrom can bring that. Um, yeah. But this is not a player that I think is going to necessarily put a big dent into San Jose's top six long term. Yeah, for sure. I think the the main thing that stands out for me with with Estrom, you know, you mentioned the goal scoring ability. I think that you know his his ability to kind of diversify his his goal scoring skill set has been a big plus. He's gone from pretty much a straight line shooter, a player who scores off the cycle a lot, uh, and a lot of his you know goal scoring touches come off of cycles where he's moving off the puck, finding pockets, lifting a stick, you know bringing up a stick in the slot and kind of getting a shot off to a player who's able to score off the rush, who's able to get involved off the rush as well. Um, even though skating is pretty average, I think the positioning off the rush is really good. He delegates early in transition. So he'll, you know, push the puck up to a teammate and then skate off the puck and find a little spot in the offensive zone from which he can rip the puck. Um, he's gotten more comfortable on the backhand. He, he's gone from a pure snapper to, uh, you know, use, being able to use his wrist shot, being able to use his one timer, so I think diversifying his offensive skill set, uh, especially in terms of goal scoring, has come a long way. But um, at the World Junior, I also thought that he was really good when complemented with goal scoring forwards. When he's playing with goal scoring wingers um, at the World Juniors, he kind of molded his game into a playmaking role really well. Uh, he was obviously first and foremost a defensive center. First and foremost, he was taking defensive zone faceoffs and you know playing that physical four checking hockey um when, when changing off the fly uh he was tasked with a lot of defensive minutes top penalty killing minutes all that stuff but he was still able to bring that playmaking element so i think there's still a well-roundedness to his offensive skill set that does stand out um just like you mentioned there's nothing really that really pops off to you in terms of an ability um so th that kind of holds him back uh but yeah i mean overall what do you what do you think in terms of the prospects vegas had available where does he stand and could they have traded anyone else that could have interested the San Jose Sharks that could have made more sense? Or He, he was the most interesting piece uh, in that Vegas prospect pool, for sure. I mean, Brendan Brisson would have been another option, but he's been stuck at about half a point a game in the AHL this season, and he's a couple years older than Edstrom, and he's very much a bit, a bit more uh, one-dimensional in terms of being like a, a power play shooter. There's some flashes of defensive upside with him, but with Edstrom, you have a really solid identity that I think will translate very seamlessly to an NHL role. Now, where that figures in the bottom six remains to be seen. Like, he might top out as a, as a really good 4C. It's possible. Uh, and he's not a player that I personally would have drafted in the first round last season. Uh, but... I, I certainly saw the allure from a contender's perspective to add a player like Edstrom, and he certainly fits uh, what San Jose has been lacking in their prospect pool and in their NHL lineup as well. So I, I understand the targeting of Edstrom. I do think that there is perhaps an overvaluation of what he's going to bring at the end of the day in this trade. But he's going to be a really solid San Jose Shark for quite a long time. The question remains to be seen of, is that going to be in like, 12 minute a night roll or a 16 minute a night roll and that remains a big question yeah. mark we'll see how his development continues over the next year or two but he's probably only like a year and a half or two years away from playing solid nhl minutes so you're getting a player relatively soon in this deal which i'm sure was also important for san jose but the upside is a little bit limited uh in the return here yeah it makes sense uh but that wraps things up for our second segment we'll talk about david estrom's projection and his fit within the san jose sharks system after these messages from our sponsors at fanduel say goodbye to busted brackets because fanduel lets you bet on every single game in the tourney whether you're betting on a big upset or on a one seed it's time to go dancing on america's number one sports book Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks that you can use on point spreads, money lines, single game parlays, and far more. You can even pick who you think is going to win it all. I know I personally am always a very big fan of those single game parlays, especially when you are attending a game live in person just to make the action a little bit more exciting. Uh, just visit fanduel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. 
Alrighty, so moving on to our final segment, we'll be talking about the projection for David Estrom, where he ends up in San Jose's roster in two, three, four years, and also where he slots within the San Jose Sharks' current prospect pool. Uh, we'll start with the first part of that. I think we alluded to it a bit in the second segment. Um, but yeah, for me, I see David Estrom as a potential third-line center, a player who will play those shutdown minutes, who will play that that kind of top pair, uh, that, that, that top penalty-killing role really well. Uh, a player you can trust in the last minutes of the game is going to give you some solid minutes. Uh, when the game's on the line, you're down by one, you're up by one, whatever it is. Um, if you have a defensive zone faceoff, you'll more than likely win it and uh, get you the puck settled and ready to break out. Um, do you kind of agree with that assessment in terms of third line defensive center, trustable in the last minutes of the game, really useful on a contender, that kind of stuff, right? Fully agree. I, Edstrom is a very useful player. Like he, he's going to be useful for a very long time. And that, that that's one bonus here, I guess, in the trade is that San Jose is getting a very high likelihood piece in the future, which is important to get back when, you, when you're trading away a player of the caliber of Thomas Hurdle. But I think one of my critiques here uh, with the trade, which I also alluded to in the last segment was I, I don't believe that Edstrom is like a top five forward prospect uh, in, in San Jose's pool. And that is a little bit of a disappointing return for a player like Thomas Hurdle, like Quentin Musty, Will Smith, uh, Thomas Bortolo, William Eklund, if you can still call him a prospect, which he barely is anymore. Um, even mm-hmm. a guy like Daniil Gushin, I think, has has more upside than a player like David Edstrom. But um, like Philip Bistet, I, I'd probably take Edstrom over Bistet. But at best, Edstrom is like the fifth best forward prospect in in in, in this depth chart, and yeah, like it's it, it's a return. Um, it, it definitely it, it addresses a need, and 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 I keep coming back to this yeah. specifically because San Jose does have a need. They have a lot of players like Daniel Gushin and William Eklund, Quentin Musty, Will Smith, Casper Halton, and Tristan Robbins, the list goes on of, of, of players with a lot of soft skill, but who need to be surrounded by a little bit more physicality and perhaps defensive reliability and face-off skill in order to prioritize retaining possession rather than just creating with it. And uh, Edstrom mm-hmm. certainly adds uh, on, on that front. So he does address a need. I think that, that San Jose Sharks fans are going to really appreciate this player for a very long time. But I do think that there will be a, a lasting sense of bitterness that 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 he is likely like well, one of the only two pieces you're getting back for for hurdle with retention as well as two third round draft picks. I would have aimed my sight as a little bit higher personally if I'd been able to, but it was a buyer's market uh, and 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 the trade was made. But just a really fascinating one. But the return is not one that I think I personally would have been enticed enough by to to trade a player like Thomas Hurdle when there was really no rush to do so. Yeah, for sure. That's the other thing. Like they have him locked in long term. Why would they pull the triggers this quickly? This you know, this urgently. And yeah, it, it just, I feel like they could have gotten a lot more from another team out of, out of hurdle because uh, yeah, Vegas just keeps trading away everything they have. And at some point they kind of run out of assets. Um, you know, they're, they're getting close to it now, but overall, I think that, you know, the, the issue is there were other teams probably willing to give more. And if you're trading in division, this is underwhelming. Um, you know, we see a lot of teams take a discount on the return because they don't want to face that player. They don't want to bolster a team in their own division. Now, this doesn't cost San Jose as much because San Jose is a true um, tanking team. You know, they're looking to lose those games against Vegas, and this helps. But overall, I think if you're looking long-term, two, three, four years in the future when Eklund will be kind of approaching his prime, when... Other players like Musty and Smith and those guys are kind of clawing into the roster and trying to make a spot for themselves. This makes a bit less sense. Um, The other issue for me is, for me, Quentin Musty and Will Smith, you know, I could see that be a one-two punch down the middle for a long time. Eklund can also take face off, but he's mainly been playing on the wing. But this kind of forces Edstrom to play that 3C role, unless you're looking to move Musty to to the wing. You know, and I could see that yeah. happen. I could see Quentin Musty and David Estrem kind of interchange at the center slot on the th- on the second line if Estrem develops his offensive skill even more and becomes even better at 
extending offensive zone possessions. Because right now, Estrom is really good at securing possession in the defensive zone, in the neutral zone with good positioning, good stick work, all that good stuff. But when it comes to extending offensive zone possession in the offensive zone, uh, that's where things kind of start to, um, to kind of be a bit, a bit more unstable with Estrom's game. Uh, but if he can get better at that, I think that'd be a great sign that Estrom can be a second line center, but it, it'll take a decent amount of progress. Um, overall, in terms of the fit within San Jose's system, in terms of where he slots in within um, the prospects that they have, the three that I'd say are locks to be better prospects um, in terms of upside for me than, than Estrom are William Eklund, obviously, if he still counts as a prospect, Quentin Musty and Will Smith. Those are the three bona fide ones. Then there's a conversation to be had with Matthias Havilid, uh, with uh, Philip Bistad as well. I think those two are in conversation with Estrem, but he's at Canyone. best the fourth best prospect for me. Canyoni as well, but even with Canyoni, we're talking about a player who was picked fairly late. Um, oh, yeah, he still has sure. a lot of problems. The value I is different. I, I, yeah, for sure. Like I, I would personally prefer Cagnoni because I'm a big fan of Luca Cagnoni's game. But in terms of realistically, I would say that you know, Estrem is still overall a better prospect. If we don't just count upside, if we just look at the overall picture, for me, Estrem is at best the fourth best prospect in San Jose's pool. Would you agree with that? I think that, like it's even more optimistic than, than than where I'm at, which is which is interesting because I I was higher on Estrem in last draft cycle than you were. Like I, I and I wasn't very high on him. I, I'm ranked like 47th overall, I believe, or something in that range. Uh, like a couple, like two or three spots yeah. behind Casper Haltonen. and uh, yeah, like I I think he he's really solid and and in any other deal i think i i've been very very happy to see san jose acquire this player i think he fits really seamlessly i just think that the price of acquisition here is a little bit lopsided but if we were to to pivot perhaps to uh trade grades here what's your valuation of how these two uh th these two teams uh did in this trade yeah, Vegas did excellent for me. I think that, you know, for on their side, it's a bona fide A. I would I would honestly call this a steal for them. They barely gave anything to get a really good top six forward who's going to be playing some solid minutes for them. Um, maybe there's something we don't know. Maybe something behind the, 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 you know, behind closed doors that, you know, there's information maybe about hurdles, injuries or, you know, issues off the ice, you know, in terms of the fit with the locker room that may san jose give so little um get so little in return uh but you know if i'm a vegas golden knights uh staff member or member on their team or fan i mean i'm elated with this with this trade uh and meanwhile if i'm a sharks fan i'm I, i'd be just completely confused as to what happened here because thomas hurdle was one of the bigger pieces available and i understand that it was a it was a buyer's market um but Still, there should have been more in this. Um, but yeah, in terms of grades, def a definite A for for Vegas and for me, a, a a really a generous D for San Jose. Like this was a rough one. Yeah, I, th I think I'll I'll go with like a a, a D plus. I'll I'll give I'll give San Jose the D the, the plus on the D valuation just just because I, I I do think that the fit with Estrom is really seamless and. We'll see what they do with, with that first round draft pick, right? I mean, they, they went out and drafted Quentin Musty with the late first last year. If they can get a similar like level of player in terms of upside, it changes the dimensions of this trade significantly. Uh, and and um, I, I think I want to be a little bit hopeful here for the Sharks, but at the very least, this is going to help the Sharks in terms of tanking because Thomas Hurdle is going to return in the regular season. Now, whether he would have done so if he'd stayed with the Sharks, I don't know. But but at the very least, they are very much dedicated to tanking this season. And of course, if they end up adding Mac with Celebrini, no one's going to be thinking about Thomas Hurdle anymore in, in, in like two years time in terms of a need for the team at the moment. If you're able to to send out Will Smith and Mac and Celebrini as your top two C's or even Caden Lindstrom instead, like. The draft pick could really, really change the outlook here, but I think in a vacuum, this was a bit of a disappointing return, certainly, for the Sharks. Yeah, for sure. But that wraps things up for today's show. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. Again, we're so close to a 1,000 subscribers. It helps us out a lot if you hit that little button. Uh, leave us a comment letting us know what you think of the trade, what you think of the episode, uh, what you think of uh, David Ashram as well.
Oh, uh, if you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform, please leave us a rate and review. It helps the channel out a lot. And make sure to make us your first listen of the day. For your second listen of the day, make sure to check out Lockdown Sports today. They've got all your news and updates about what's going on around sports. And make sure to tune in for our next show as we continue our breakdowns of some trades that happened at the trade deadline involving prospects. This has been Hattie Kalakesh with Sebastian High, and we hope you tune in next time.